Anybody? Anybody rock in pajamas? Okay, I'm proud of you. So we are really excited to get the, the Congress started again today. Uh, we have an amazing speaker, but I don't need to introduce them. I would like to have two of my best friends in the whole world introduce them. So first I'm going to have Justin Stewart of AAPM come on up. So Justin, come on up. And everybody in a round of applause for AAPM because they have sponsored the meeting. So we're giving up there because it's fine Justin today. Thank you, Brad. I'm the only person at FizzCon wearing a tie, but that's uh, what we call branding, an AAPM tie. <laughs> uh, good morning and welcome to your plenary session for the day. Uh, as Brad mentioned, my name is Justin Stewart. I'm the Director of Programs for the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, AAPM. Uh, and I'm here to introduce your wonderful, wonderful keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Julianne Pollard-Larkin is an associate professor of medical physics at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. She is the service chief medical physicist in MD Anderson's thoracic radiation oncology clinic. Dr. Pollard-Larkin also conducts clinical research and mentors and teaches medical physics residents, radiation oncology residents, and graduate students. Her primary research interests include flash, ultra, high dose radiotherapy, <clears throat> pacemaker radiotherapy dose measurements, and improving the efficacy of motion management in thoracic treatments in radiobiology. Julianne is also the chair of the AAPM Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, as well as the chair of the American Institute of Physics Liaison Committee on Underrepresented Minorities. She received her PhD in biomedical physics at UCLA and her BS in physics and mathematics at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. After receiving her PhD at UCLA, Julianne was accepted into the medical physics residency program at MD Anderson in Houston. Following her residency, Julianne was hired by MD Anderson as faculty. Beyond her role in the clinic and classroom, Julianne is a firm believer in outreach and increasing the pipeline of women and underrepresented populations in science. Ensuring that more underrepresented students and women follow in her footsteps is Julianne's passion. Now very quickly, from my perspective as a very member-facing staff leader at an incredibly member-dependent organization, any AAPM headquarters team member and any active AAPM member volunteer who realizes Julie is part of a group they will be working with or part of an initiative they will be working on immediately smiles very widely. You're all about to find out why. Julie's passion, kindness, humor, and dedication are absolutely invaluable to AAPM, to medical physics, and frankly, the world. Please join me in welcoming your plenary speaker in a bit and a genuine friend to STEM, Julie Pollard Larkin. And as is tradition, we always have a student introduce our plenary speakers. So I'd like to welcome to the stage an amazing undergraduate from Lycoming College, Sill, and a great friend. Come on up. Thank you, Brad. Hello, FizzCon. Uh, I am <laughs> I am still friend of Kleinsesser at the AZZ for Zone Three. Where's Zone Three at? Woo! Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing our next plenary speaker, Dr. Julianne Pollyad Larkin. Dr. Pollyad Larkin was inspired to pursue a career in medical physics when her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was a physics and math major at the University of Miami at the time. The medical physicist who worked with her mother's treatment team showed her that she could fight cancer with her passion for physics. Since a young age, Dr. Paulia Larkin had a passion for equity and inclusion in physics. Her first experience with physics education was tainted by racial bias. Her teacher did not want to waste her time teaching a class with black and Hispanic students. But Dr. Julianne Paulia Larkin refused to be dissuaded from her dreams and earned her PhD in biomedical physics at the University of California. She was the first black woman to do so. 
She then began a clinical residency in medical physics at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, where she is an associate professor of physics today. Diversity in physics has improved somewhat since Dr. Polly Larkin has began her career, but systematic racism, biases, and discrimination continue to deter students eager to enter the field. Dr. Julianne Park, uh, Pollard Larkin refuses to, oh, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Ju Pollard Larkin ref works to lessen the barriers that prevent underrepresented students from joining and remaining in physics. Barriers like hostile departments and poor mentoring. She now heads equity and inclusion efforts for the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. Dr. Pollard Larkin has spent her career fighting, fighting against cancer and fighting for equity in our field. It is an honor to have her with us today. Everyone, please welcome me in joining Dr. Julianne Pollard Largan to the stage. Oh my goodness, thank you guys so much for being awake. Good morning, Society of Physics students all up in here from zone one through 100. I wanna hear y'all say hello, come on. Good morning. Good morning. Woo! I want you to know I come from the best zone, zone 14, stand up. You know who you are, wonderful Texas, huh, one, three? 13, 13, Texas, go ahead, stand up and be proud. Hook them, whatever you need. I may not know my zone number, but I know that I'm in the best organization. I want to say thank you to all of the leaders, especially from Brad Conrad to all of the wonderful people from SPS, American Institute of Physics, AAPM, AAPT, everybody who had anything to do with my, um, me being here right now, thank you. Why? Because 20 years ago, I was just like you. And I want everyone in this room to understand, this talk is not just for minorities, it's not just for women. It is for any person who ever had a dream and wanted to see it through. That is what this talk is about. I want you to understand, people and challenges in life will come regardless of how you identify. It is up to you to determine if your goal is worth the fight. So fighting isn't the problem, it's figuring out what is your why. It doesn't matter how you look on the outside, it doesn't matter how people are gonna try to categorize you. It matters how you see yourself. And I want you to understand, you are worth it. You take up space, you have mass, so guess what, baby? You matter. I want you to understand. I hope you like that physics joke. Oh, it hit. All right. So without further ado, I, I just want you to know I'm really like this all the time. I was like this at 4 a.m. So the title of today's talk, and this is how I give lectures. So if you ever want to come to MD Anderson for our medical physics program, you know who to hit up. The title of today's talk is Attitude, Aptitude, and Altitude. My journey from physics student to physics leader. Today I'm going to talk to you about basically who I am. Because you heard the wonderful comments coming from Justin as well as from Soparina about who I am and who you think I may be based upon my bio. I'm going to help break that down some more. I'm going to talk to you about a term that many of you guys may not know, um, psychological safety, but it is essential for you as a student to master your field and your science. Then I'm going to talk to you about some equity, diversity, and inclusion um, definitions, talk about what's going on within our pipeline within STEM, talk to you about the diversity statistics within radiation oncology, which is my domain, and as well as the recommendations that I help come up with with regard to equity, diversity, and inclusion within the AAPM. So it's a lot, but it's useful. I have to give you a quick disclaimer because we do have a contract with my university at Mobitron. This is a quote that my father told me all the way up until he passed. It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. Let that sit for a second. Many people will tell you, oh, you're smart, you got it. That's not enough. Your attitude, your willingness to tackle problems that you can't solve on based upon your aptitude, that is the determinant for how far you will go. You need to get beyond thinking that we are just born naturally smart, born math problem solvers, born physicists. You are capable of learning all the skills of all the faculty that are sitting in this space right now. Anybody with gray hair or gray hair covered that's sitting amongst you, you can learn our skill set if you have a growth mindset. There is no one better than you just in and of who they are. You have the capabilities within yourself to be anything that you want to be if you're willing to put the work forth for it. So who am I? I'm the happiest physicist that I hope you ever meet in your life. I, literally, I have the best life. I don't want you to think, oh God, she's just a struggle story. She's just like woman king. Go ahead, Wakanda. No. 
no. Medical physics pays me well. I'm, I'm good. I'm really happy. I want you to understand these wonderful little children that I have, my little milk chocolate drops, my husband, the actual job that I have as a physics leader. I'm a service chief. I'm a boss. Dude, I'm happy. I, I want you to understand. Yes. Now, there may be statistics that say that there are very few black women in physics, and after 2017, they believe there is only going to be 74 of us. I want you to understand, these numbers are flawed. And no matter what statistics says that you are not likely to succeed in a field or a given dream, it doesn't matter because you just persist harder. My start was in the military because I was a brat. My father was a, hey, other military brats. My father was a colonel, a colonel in the army when I was born. I got to live abroad with my family. The most formative experience happened in Pemerson's Germany where the teachers were so mean, it helped us learn four languages by the time we were three years old. Brad, I was disfluent at four just speaking four different languages. Why? Because they realized that every student in that particular system actually had the capability to expand their processes of um, um, language development and actually adequately learn all those different languages, as well as the math and science that you had for those particular age levels. So they were drilling us in those schools. Then I got to go to Miami, and that's where I got my cultural roots. I want you to understand, I am not Hispanic, but I am such an ally. I Bienvenido a Miami, that was when I actually finally got to understand what it meant to be truly proud of your heritage. How many of you guys have ever been to Miami? Beautiful, thank God. And if you hadn't raised your hand, you need to leave right now, I'm sorry. It'll help change your life. Why? Because there, people don't hide who they are. If they're Colombiano, what, they're going to put that in your face. Wepa, they're going to let you know. Nobody's going to be embarrassed. Everybody wears their heritage with pride. And there's a power in that that I think a lot of us don't really pick up on. And then I had my formative parents, my mom, an educator, a business teacher, who back in those times, as you can see lovely in this diagram, there actually were pictures of them sitting next to typewriters. Because guess what? Back in the day when I was young, I'm just a little bit younger than you, typewriters were still in their heyday. She taught kids in the inner city how to do what was called midnight typing. She made this idea up where she would cut off the lights and guess what? Yell at them what to type fast. And she talked faster than me. And they kept up with her. They won awards for that. And then my dad, the colonel, Colonel David E. Pollard, I want you to understand, he also was teaching in the NRC, but at a high school level for JROTC. And instilling those students in that particular area who many people thought were disadvantaged and had no hope, he gave them that hope from his experiences from across the world and from growing up as a son of a sharecropper. So I had these wonderful, powerful educators in my life, and it helped to give me this wonderful, playful personality that you have today. Please note, this is a story in three pictures. Notice that the frame on the set, um, set on the left-hand side, you see me sitting at the table with my parents and an unnamed gentleman in the suit on my right. What you notice is that that particular guy is very old, much older than myself at that time. I was eight, he was about 17. But even at that young, precocious age, I was so so convincing. Yes, Dr. Sansi, even back then when I was just eight years old, could barely even look up to see his head all the way. I knew how to sugar talk somebody and get him at his ball, his Gerald TC ball, to leave his girlfriend behind and end up dancing with me. I don't think anyone's shocked by that from this front table. What I want you to understand, who you are as a child doesn't leave you just because you turn 40 or God forbid 41. You are still that wonderful, annoying little sister or brother that you've always been. And that particular way that you interact with people, you can hone it and use it as a tool to improve who you are as an educator, as a com communicator, and as a scientist. And so as a very young age, I was very clear that I loved science and I was a, a happy, chubby little nerd. I was a super reader and I wasn't scared of standing next to signs that declared that. So I had a passion for science and any type of knowledge, but it wasn't until I saw this picture of this woman here floating in space in 1993 that I understood how much I would put my life towards science until then. This picture is of Dr. Mae Jemison, taken in about June 1993. She was the first black woman to go to space. An image like this was never even imagined up until that point. It shocked my little world. When I was just about 12 years old, looking at this photo, I realized that my dreams for myself were much too small. Girl, you can go further. 
Once I saw that we could have sisters leave the earth and go to space, didn't you know that I was like, why can't I? Once you see it, then you can believe it, then you can achieve it. That's the motto of 100 Black Men of Houston, as well as several different organizations that try to do outreach in the community. I want you to understand that same principle today. Look amongst you. See those people who are already the innovators, the researchers, the scientists, the doctors, the whoever, the professors that you want to be who represent yourself in some type of identity way. That is your sign that, yes, you can, and you can even outdo us. So after I saw that, I knew I would doggedly stick to science. So it was no shock when I got to high school that I decided to take physics at an AP level. Back in my day, before they let you take AP physics, you had to prove yourself during the summer. So I had to take a summer physics honor course in the middle of my high school um, career. So about, I was about a sophomore. It was about June of 1996, somewhere around there. And I was going into the classroom, and I sat down right up front, much like this little man, Aaron, right here in front of me. And I was eager, right next to the lectern, had my physics book open and ready. And I couldn't wait to see what I was going to be taught, because this is going to help me get closer to being like Dr. Mae Jemison. The professor came in, got to the lectern like I am now, looked at the class, much like I'm looking at you, holding her book, dropped it on the lectern, and then muttered just loud enough for me to hear, why should I even waste my time, and then walked out. What I want you to understand, forgive me, AV people in the back, I won't touch my hair again. I realized at that moment, not all of the equity, diversity, and inclusion, <laughs> you know, issues that were brought up with her saying that, but that, oh my God, someone was standing, trying to stand in my path from becoming the type of scientist that I wanted to become. And guess what? Young little Julie Pollard at that time decided that was not acceptable. So I didn't even sit and understand all the ramifications of what that could mean, if that was bias and everything like that. Because as a young person, you don't care about bias. You don't care about racism, sexism, and the isms. You care about your dream. You care about your goal. So what did I decide? My dream mattered more than her problem. It was her problem. I want you to understand that. Racism is not your problem to solve. Sexism, abuse, all of these things. People think, oh, it's because of your community. Sad thing, you guys got to figure that one out. No, it's not. You have a dream, grit, find a path around them, and persist. It is not for them to tell you no. There are many reasons why people may not like you. And some of them might be justified, let's be real. Some of us are annoying. I am sometimes. I admit it. I'm loud. And so you need to understand it is OK for people to tell you no, for faculty to tell you no, for you not to get the award that you thought you were meant for. You, well, I met all the criteria. I don't know why you gave it to her. I, I just don't get it. No, it is OK. Try again. New path. One closed door shows you an open window. So at that time, when that teacher did that, I went down to the principal's office and said, hey, we need to get a substitute teacher because Julie's got an AP physics class to get into in about three months. So let's get this together. And they found another teacher to deal with us until she came back. I want you to understand, there are solutions. Does, does it feel weird and crummy to have to work it out? Yes. Is it fair? No. But life isn't. And you only get one shot, so make the most of it. Don't sit around crying over things. Work it out and find the people who will work with you. There is something that you should be thinking about. Whatever struggle you are going with right now, personally, interpersonally, or whatever, it's not as bad as what people had 20, 50, 100 years ago. We're in the centennial celebration of this organization. Think about what that first class went through. When this room looked nothing like this, you don't realize the strength in this room. 20 years ago, when I was a young SPS member, I could never have imagined sitting amongst multitudes like you with all of your different backgrounds, all of your different vices and the different things that you guys represent and all the different places and experiences. You have so much strength. You have so many potential allies that you don't know about. So you have to grit your teeth and realize this. Refuse to be anything but successful as how you define it. And what people may forget is that your biggest allies may be the people who you consider to be family, whether they're related by DNA or however. 
I had such a powerhouse team, and my parents, my sister, and all of our cousins and so forth, who actually are in the DC area. Please understand, when you see somebody, even if they happen to be a minority, you have no idea that they may not be first-gen college student, because I definitely am not. My parents had masters. My dad got his PhD posthumously, but he was finishing up right before he passed. I want you to understand, everybody, just by looking at them, you can't tell their whole story. Please believe, there is so much great behind your story and who you are. And what you can do is find the people who may not even be connected to you by blood who can help mentor you towards your success. We all need help. And in fact, mentorship has been shown by studies to prevent girls from dropping out of science and math classes. You need to understand, just by getting the mentor who can see you as culturally or identity re relevant, that can change the entire trajectory of your life. Also, if you happen to come from a racially underrepresented or ethnic background, having that one teacher who identifies much like yourself can make sure that you actually graduate on time. You have no idea, just by virtue of finding that one mentor, you can truly help to increase your odds. So do what it takes to make the right connections, to make the networking skills that you need here in order to grow and become that dream um, physicist that you have in your mind. And even when you get to the faculty level, because many of you think, oh, once I'm done with undergrad and grad school, I'm done. I don't need mentors. I don't need to tell anyone when I don't understand something. No, you never stop needing mentorship. Mentorship helps even faculty. The study done by researchers at my particular department has shown that even when you provide mentorship for faculty, it helps to improve our academic progress as well as the likelihood of us um, getting promoted. You need mentorship. You need help, coaching, and advice all the way up until you finish your career. So I want you to totally understand something. I don't want you just to walk in and schlep in and just make it through the day and just like, oh, well, at least I made it without tripping. No, don't water yourself down. I want you to find your passion and thrive. Find out what wakes you up, what gets you so excited that you can't wait to take on your day. Also, be sure to be proud of your roots and your heritage, everything that explains who you are and how you eat, how you dance, and how you enjoy life. Let it be something that speaks to who you are and even affects how you deliver academically. To this point, there's a number of us who have names that are difficult for, you know, um, for some segment of the population to pronounce. Please. Don't cut off your name just because you're embarrassed and you don't want to explain your ethnicity or what are the reasons that your family gave you that name. This story from this orange is a new black actor, Uzo Aduba, explains exactly how critical it is to stay ethically tied even with your name. When she grew up, not that many people had African sounding names like her own. And so she was tired because no one could say Uzo Amaka. So she came home from school one day and she said to her mom, nobody can say my name, can't you just call me Zoe? So without skipping a beat, what did her mom tell her, everyone? She said, if they can learn how to say Tchaikovsky, if they can learn to say Michelangelo, if they can say Dostoevsky, if they can say all of that, then guess what? They can learn to say Uzo Amaka. You need to get excited about who you are and not hide it. Also, get to know that as you grow and you get into different situations where you don't feel comfortable and stuff, learn how to, if you must, code switch and adapt. Learn how to interact with people in such a way that allows for you to be open and receptive so that you can communicate with one another and move forward in your projects and goals. And then when you meet somebody from the hood, don't worry to let fam know. Like I see fam you right now. I just want to make sure I, I see you. I see you fam you. That's Florida up in here. And so as a Florida girl and right on time, I'm sorry it's not a fam you picture. You know, it's all right because I'm from the U. Anybody who knows who Dwayne The Rock is, you realize, hopefully you realize if you've done any background, that that just like myself, yeah, I put myself in the same category, we both went to University of Miami and one of us graduated. And then I went, <laughs> yay, yay. Sorry, all right, and then, <laughs> Also, I've got to move on to UCLA, which I do believe, even if you don't go there, just visit. 
just check it out. If they allow you to visit their campus, it is the most beautiful campus and it has some of the richest resources when it comes to an R01 research institution that you can imagine. So it'll connect you with physicists and mathematicians and Nobel Prize winners that you could never imagine working with. That was formative for me in identifying the biomedical physics program that allowed me to be the medical physicist that I am today. It was there that I got to start to do, finally, real scientific research. I got the white lab coat. I'm sorry, but that is, the, that is all you want. You know, as a little kid, Kid, you're like, until I get the white lab coat, I'm not a scientist. That's when I was smiling. That's when I was so precocious and happy and the world was amazing. And I was even meeting celebrities on the side. That A lot of you may not know who that is. That's Angelina Jolie way before the six or seven children that she has now. And so I want you to understand, you can have joy in your science. And it is not until that day, dissertation, defense, everybody who's gone through that, man, just quiet fist in the air. Because that, you know it. You did that. And I don't care what you are, what color, creed, background you have, it hit hard. Because you had to defend your science, your contribution to the field. That moment, it's better than childbirth. Even for those of you who will never give birth, I want you to understand. <laughs> because it came from you, you imagined it, it was all your work, and you get that credit alongside your team members who are part of your defense team. And that moment, I love that my mom got it. I just let go. It really was an exciting time at UCLA. And at that moment, I learned from my good and my bad times. All of the bad back and forth conversations I had with my PI, who was nicely blocked out in the photo, because let's be real, you know, you go through things, but it was worth it. I want you to understand, every challenge that I had in graduate school, the um, projects that got shut down because of lack of funding, the um, disagreements with my fellow team members about how to move forward in, a, in an experiment, and and then the lack of um, ability to get the researchers you want to collaborate with you. It is worth the fight. Hustle on. I want you, as you're considering graduate school, I know some of you are thinking about delaying it, skipping a year, doing all kinds of things. Find the people in the programs you already want to go to. Get to know what they're going through now. Get your mind strong. It's not about just working out physically, y'all. No, you guys are going to be mental champions and giants. You need to work out the mental fortitude and also something that nobody's probably going to talk to you about, the emotional fortitude. And I'm not just talking to the women up in here. I want you to understand, people are gonna bully you. I want you to get that. I'm talking academic bullying, like, oh, that's your project? Oh, well, I thought someone worked on that two years ago. Oh, uh, underwhelming. And, and like little comments, cutting you off when you're trying to describe your results, not letting you speak when you wanted to during meetings, and you're trying to stand up and explain yourself. Those kind of little biting things that hit all of us hard, because it hits at who we identify ourselves as. We think we're scientists. We think we have something with value to give. I want you to understand, it is still worth it. Fight on. If you remember anything from me, fight on. I don't care who makes fun of you, who, gives you, who makes you feel excluded. There are faculty like me, either in the dean's office or literally at MD Anderson, who will reach across the state and deal with it if I have to. I will fight for you, your other faculty there. Make sure you choose departments where you have Dr. Sansi's, where you have people who are looking out for you who are wanting to see you succeed. It matters who they are as people, not just how great their papers are. So you better look deeper than a paper when you pick a department. Find people who, when you come for the interview, they're like, I like that kid. I, I, I can see how you could contribute here. Oh, I love that person. You, you watch that show? So do I. That's awesome. You want somebody who sees you, recognizes your talent, and, and approves of you as a whole individual. There's more to you than just a brain. So the graduation experience, don't skip it. I know many of my friends who, after going through um, unfortunate trials and tribulations during their grad program, they decided to skip it. They're like, after seven years, I just want to get a job and go, go to sleep. That's all they wanted to do. I'm telling you, I flew back. I was excited. I lived it up. I borrowed my friend's um, gown, which you can do. Nobody needs to pay $1,000. I will tell you right now, that is a trap. Don't do it. And even that's faculty. I don't own one yet. Please just borrow it, rent it, and rock it out and get all the selfies to prove you were there. And then from that moment to all of a sudden in 2019's American Association of Physics and Medicine's meeting, I got to finally live out my dream of being on a stage much like the same size of this, talking about one of my pet projects, Flash Ultra High Dose Radiotherapy, on a large platform. This is something that I was just thinking about as a little wee bitty child, and I never thought it would happen as soon as it did till 2019, which is still a very long time. 
The whole backstory on flash radiotherapy, if you guys haven't heard about it, is the fact by changing one parameter as you deliver radiation therapy, nominally just the dose rate, going from 1.8 gray per minute, which is a slow dose rate and normal for um, delivering radiotherapy to mice, to 3,600 gray per minute, what you can do is protect normal tissue while still killing cancer cells. If this holds true for multiple disease sites and settings, we can cure cancer if it holds true. Right now, we're getting exciting developments. Ever since pretty much about 2014, the Favadon Group in Switzerland have been showing us results that have shocked the nations. And I don't mean just America. If this holds true, if we are able to understand the biological underpinnings for this particular technology, we will help our entire human race, the one race, make it forward. I want you to get excited about where we are standing in science right now. At the Centennial, radiation therapy is having an amazing um, underswell of excitement for what is potentially possible. What does this look like? It also, if you were to look at the pig skin and you give flash radiotherapy shots on one side of the pig, shown on the lower panel, and then you gave conventional slow dose radiation on the top panel to the pig skin on the other side of it, you notice the lack of necrotic centers in those areas where the shot was delivered. That's protection, children. That is incredible. You do not expect to see that. If we are able to translate that to humans, which we are now trying to do in clinical trials all the way across Europe, as well as across America, we will change the likelihood of better life and outcome for our populations. This is needed, given that one in two of us, I want you to understand that, one in two of us will have to deal with cancer personally. This is, not, this is no longer a test. This is your fight too, whether you do or don't want to join medical physics. It's okay, it's not gonna hurt me if you say no, but I want you to understand you care about these results too. And so they even did studies where they irradiated a full mouse gut, which is shown on the other side, and the red curve shows what happens for flash radiotherapy mouse life expectancy. Notice that they held still about 95% of them surviving after all those time points, and then those who got conventional full gut radiation, they died very early on. How do we deliver electron flash? multiple ways. Pretty much we can get any old linear accelerator and crank it up and tune it such that you're able to give dose rates in the order of a 300 gray per second all to 200 gray per second. My department is so dedicated in flash radiotherapy that they literally made it, my division head, Dr. Albert Kuhn, made it one of our pillars for our entire department. And so we have teams now headed by the wonderful Dr. Emil Schuler at my school now who is leading the efforts to make this clinically translatable, meaning that hopefully within one year's time, you can even send people from your family or friends or even enemies down to MD Anderson and other places and get a clinical trial in FLASH. What do we do in order to allow us to do this wonderful project? We have FLASH in three different systems right now at MD Anderson that we're using either for just research purposes and or the potential for a patient treatment. Normally what you'll see on the left-hand side, you'll see the Mobitron unit, which is a unit that you can just, a device you can buy for any center of your choice that has been modified modified to deliver flash radiotherapy. Our proton center gantry sitting there dead center in the middle. Not only do we use it heavily for a lot of our pediatric and, pro and prostate patients, we also are tuning it so that we have one gantry that does flash radiotherapy, but with proton beams. And we already know that the reason we like protons is because they are actually heavy and they're able to actually stop at the end of the tumor range. That is something that allows for them to even be more preferentially preferred for flash radiotherapy, and as well as utilizing a new tuned Varian Clinac. I want you to understand, for pediatric patients, there has been a clinical trial that at the start of the pandemic has been unveiled for Ohio State. So this is very much real. This is happening now on a small scale so that we can prove its efficacy before it is launched um, quite broadly for all types of patients. And then a reason why you want to join Zone 13 is because TMC3 is on the way. TMC3, or I like to call it TMC cubed, is Texas Medical Center's biggest advancement for biomedical science period. I'm talking about over 5 million square feet of research space for people much like yourself. If you're a faculty member or a future faculty member, please believe you're going to want to give us a shout. Why? Because right now, literally by the end of the year, we're starting to open up space that's going to be shaped just like this wonderful double helix trying to mimic the DNA strand itself. That is where we're going to have all the top researchers from the world all descend to help to make literally not just cancer history, but all kind of disease site history as well. So there's going to be this huge 
almost medical brain power coming in the middle of Texas, or I should say south, <laughs> southwest part of, southeast part of Texas, that you guys should be having on your horizon, especially as you consider graduate programs. Pay attention to all my people in this zone 13. I want you to understand, for it to be successful, for us to have any advancement in science, in life, or especially medicine, equity, diversity, and inclusion is a priority. Why do I say that? Because stating to you as somebody who happens to be a black woman who had two black children, you need to know the alarming statistics for mortality for black children, and I'm not even going to the mortality for the same black mothers of those children. Mortality rate for black kids is cut dramatically when black doctors care for them after birth. This shouldn't happen. You shouldn't have to have a black doctor just because you are a black patient. But listen to what they found out when they looked at the whole registry of all Florida births. Although black newborns are three times as likely to die as white newborns, when the doctor of record for black newborns, primarily those pediatricians and neonatologists and family practitioners, was also black, their mortality rate, which compared with white newborns, was cut in half. Having a culturally competent team assist you for your medical procedures can save a life. We need to understand EDI is not just a nice little catchphrase and politically correct and just makes people feel good. No, it saves lives. Having you in the room with people who identify like you helps them live. And it's just a human thing. Think about it. People that you understand and you can talk to and everything, you can get more information for them, you can help with their medical care, and you can change, adapt, and deal with them in a better way. If you don't connect, if you can't talk to one another, if you don't relate, if you're just triaging and moving through, you can't help them as effectively. So we please understand, diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential. When I talk about diversity, having people from different points of view helping solve problems, that allows for innovation, creativity, complex problem solving and even the ability to predict what's going to happen in the future for that particular system. Now when you give somebody something that's more essential, inclusion, meaning not that you're just sitting at the table, you're also able to impact what happens at the table. You get to choose the menu. That allows for enhanced engagement, increased productivity, improve job satisfaction, enhance morale, increase trustworthiness, and just the ability to then be responsive to the community as a whole. But the final layer, the hardest thing for most people to understand, equity. Once you start to give justice to people, then everyone who is a part of the system, regardless if they're underrepresented or not, then every person is provided the opportunity to attain their full potential. This is essential for you in education. If you are in a space where there is no diversity, nobody who seems to represent your particular background, if they don't listen to you, there's no inclusion. You're just sitting there and no one's answering your problems. And also, if there's no justice, nobody tries to fix that situation, you will not succeed. Period, point blank, let's not even continue. You need this in every system of life. No matter how you identify, this impacts you and your systems right now. So how do you actually move forward if you don't have inclusion or equity or diversity. It impacts something that's called psychological safety, a term that is gaining a lot of momentum within medicine, but it's essential for education too. Psychological safety just means you feel safe to be yourself and to be open, much like I'm being right now in front of you. If you have psychological safety, it means all these things are true. You can give and receive feedback. You can raise issues and concerns, disagree, ask for clarification, ask the difficult questions, offer solutions, admit errors, which is critical in medicine when people are cutting off wrong legs and stuff. You know that. It happens on a database and you're like, I can't believe they did that. Left, right, how do you get it wrong? I don't understand. It happens every day because people are overworked, under, um, under supported, and they are overwhelmed with a number of stuff and responsibilities that they have. When you have psychological safety, you can literally stop the clock and say, I need assistance, I need help, I need clarification. This is true in your classroom setting and very true when you go to graduate school. If you try to go into a lab and you don't feel psychologically safe to say, I don't understand this, can you explain this again? Um, go over that figure again. I, I don't understand how this equation works or how it applies. Explain. If you can't do that, don't join that team. Join a team where they listen to you, where they want to hear from you, where your input is valued and valuable to them. If they're not listening to you, no matter how they look like, no matter what things they have achieved individually, it's not going to help you. 
I want you to understand there is a continuation from equity, diversity, inclusion to how you feel safety-wise, psychological safety, that allows you then to become a highly reliable team. This is critical for us to understand as faculty, as teachers and educators, and as leaders within labs, as well as those of you who will be the lab members themselves. And so now to explain what equity, diversity, and inclusion is, succinctly, diversity just includes all the ways we are different. And there's so many more ways that go way deeper than just skin. It's every single aspect of who we are as a human, from our thinking style, from our race, from our religion, from our gender identity, to all the different things that makes us special and unique. That's what diversity refers to. What I want you to understand, there's a lot of diversity efforts that are underway, and sometimes people use it as a catch-all phrase to, to talk about minorities, because they don't want to say minority, because it sounds bad. So they're like, oh, diversity, you know, it's just about a collective. No, I want everyone to understand, it's about something that must exist in relationship to others. So you can't say that we got a new diverse candidate. You can't say that. A candidate is not diverse. They're a unique individual unit. Understand that diversity includes all of us, no matter how you um, identify. Diversity is just about how we are all different and interconnected in so many different ways. Now, something that is more hard to understand is equity. It is not the same as equality. And I think a lot of people think everyone's asking for equal rights, equal pay, equal, equal everything. Equality is just about sameness. It's about giving everyone the same thing irrespective of the past history and historical issues that they've undergone, as well as their current issues and obstacles that are in their way. It's just saying, here, I'm going to give you the same size stool no matter what you need, because that's what we're all getting, equality. No, equity takes context into consideration. It looks at what's going on with your circumstance compared to my own and giving you what you need to have the same access to opportunities that I have. So if you're taller or if you're shorter than me, I'm gonna give you a stool representative of that particular differential. Equity is fairness or justice. It's giving everyone the same access, it's giving everyone access to the same opportunities. And I want you to understand, within physics, you should definitely be excited about having diversity and inclusion equity within your teams. Why? Because it helps create the best science. Many of you have seen this picture of this black hole. How many of you guys have seen that picture before? How many of you guys knew about the little um, researcher who helped to describe it, shown also in the lower panel? Bowman, oh my gosh, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. In one of her interviews, because I read it, I was so excited and so proud of her, you know, a young grad student, she said, no one of us could have done it alone. It came together because of lots of different people from many backgrounds. You aren't going to prove something with your best friends from PK. You know, everyone coming from the same exact background, the same exact viewpoint, the same thinking process. You're going to need people who are instigators, who think differently than you, who challenge you, who make you question the way that you phrase things. That's how innovation happens. It doesn't happen when you're comfortable. Uh oh, I said something that I think a lot of you missed because you're tired still. You can't be comfortable and then expect to have some greatness. I want you to get that. You're going to have to get uncomfortable. You're going to have to get sweaty. You're going to have to get dirty. You're going to have to get to a point and break where you say, I don't know. I don't get it. You're going to have to get humble. You're not going to be the best all the time. And if you're ever in a situation where you're the smartest, you're the best, everyone keeps turning to you, you need a bigger room. Something is wrong, because that means you might be alone. If you keep finding yourself being the answer to all questions, be in settings that challenge you, that make you scurry, that make you pull at your pants and wonder if anyone caught the gaff that you just said. It's OK. That's how we grow. Growth mindset is your changing factor for allowing you to be that great scientist you've ever wanted to become. So in physics, please know we got so much work to do when it comes to increasing the number of underrepresented scientists within our field. Back in 2017, you saw there was only 38 Hispanic Americans and 14 African Americans who got PhD in physics. That's deplorable. That's not even worth looking at. I want to help to understand, why does this happen? You're like, well, maybe they just don't like it. Well, there's no mentors, because it's a, it's a never-ending cycle. You have so few people actually in the school system who are studying this that you end up with so few faculty to help to inspire them. Only 27 physics departments across the country at this particular time point had both African American and Hispanic faculty members. Only 27 out of 746 programs. So my likelihood of getting to meet another mentor who looks like me is down about nil. So that's why I get to go around the country making sure you see me even when you don't want to. So that no matter which program you are in, of the 746, you can say, hey, I've seen one before. 
You know you have. And it doesn't matter what background you are because I want this to become your new normal. Seeing faces that don't look like your own or that look like your own, showing you that it is possible, feasible, even for you to be even better than myself. So, and then please note that 67% of departments have neither a Hispanic American nor African American as part of their faculty members. Radiation oncology, medical physics, they also have equity concerns. Please note that in this particular time point, um, in this 2020 paper, there are only 27 radiation oncologists who are MDs in radiation oncology, full-time faculty members who identified as African American. 27 out of that grand total of 5,210 practicing physicians in the field. That is a very small number. I want you to understand, at my center, MD Anderson Cancer Center, I can't take all the credit because it happened before me, we have eight African American faculty in radiation oncology, full-time practicing professors. I want you to understand, where there is good equity, diversity, and inclusion practices, that's where people will flourish, that's where they will migrate and congregate. You need to find departments that nurture people like yourself and then spread the wealth everywhere else that you go. In my department, due to that 12% of the faculty identifying as African American amongst the radiation oncology MD cohort, that allows me the lone 3% at this particular time, the one out of 37 of the faculty members in my physics department who identify as African American. American to feel supported. If you find your, your situation to be unsupportive of you, you're the only person of your particular background, guess what? Look next door. I'm going to tell you, I literally had to stop looking in the physics department for other people who are underrepresented, and I walked myself to another department that is allied to my own. That helps me even as a faculty member, let alone as an undergrad or graduate student. You need to think outside the box. If your representation is not in this room, go outside and find it and bring it in. I need you. You need to solve these problems and then tell your team members, your supervisors, your leadership what they can do in order to follow suit to make it easier for the people behind you. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be champions for yourself. And when you happen to come from the US um, you know, talent pool where we're looking for young students to uh, you know, apply for science programs, I want you to understand we're failing regardless of color. This diagram explains the trajectory of 4 million ninth graders who are just simple American students. And I think a lot of people never see these kinds of numbers. And you're probably shocked. You're like, uh, I didn't think all of America had a problem. I just knew it was bad, but uh, Julie explained. Let me explain. This has nothing to do with color, race, or gender, or religion, or any other diversity statistic you want to throw at it. It's just 4 million American kids. Four million starting at 2001, they progress on to high school. Guess how many actually make it there? 2.8 million. We already had a slothing of kids. I don't know where they ended up. 1.2 just said bye. Deuces. Then, and it comes to time for them to graduate and everything. In the fall, how many are ready for college? Um, how many are actually preparing to get ready for college? 1.9 million. And then by the end of the fall, how many are actually college ready, meaning having their ducks in a row, having them funding and everything to be actually adequate to get into college? Only 1.3 million of those kids who started off as 4 million. Then how many came through the talent pool who are going to then even major in STEM? Out of that 1.3 million, only 278,000 then major in STEM. So y'all are seeing where this is ending up. Now, how many actually end up to be in the bucket where they get to meet a Dr. Sansi? Then only 167,000 of them graduate. You guys are amazing little, like just, I want you to understand that you have no idea what you represent statistically. You are incredible. You have beaten so many odds just to get here for breakfast. You, clap for yourself. You are incredible. I may not be anyone's mom, I shouldn't be in this room, but I want you to know, and you don't hear it enough from faculty, from your friends, and from your enemies, you are amazing. And as an educator who's starting to study these dynamics, I am thrilled by everyone's story in this room, from faculty to students to even the AV people in the back who are keeping me straight. I want you to understand, you guys have beaten so many of the odds within the United States educational system, because it's failing everyone.
Now, as you can imagine, what happens when we throw race into the mix? Yeah, it gets more interesting, a little more spicy. What I want you to see is that this diagram is super shocking. Forget that first one, it just shows that the whole US system needs work. Now, if we're gonna take race into consideration on either side of me, you can see there's that A column, which is gonna show what happens when you wanna progress to the science graduate, pro um, graduate program as a non-underrepresented minority, meaning that you're IE white or other, or the B column, which shows what happens if you're in the underrepresented minorities column where those people who identify as African-American, Hispanic, or um, specific Asian uh, populations. Notice the two tra different trajectories. Starting from the bottom, where you see everyone coming in and declaring as freshmen what they want to become. What do we all see and notice? That for the non-underrepresented freshmen, 37.6% of them say, I want to study science, I'm going to study STEM. The underrepresented freshmen, 34.8% of them. This by itself, just the bottom row, nobody tells us. We are always told, oh, you're so different. You guys don't want to do STEM. They want to do STEM. You don't want to do, no. We're sort of all sort of interested at the same levels. Yeah, I, we sort of think it's interesting. Now, how many of us at the undergraduate level, assuming once you get in there, now you've declared, how many of them actually get that undergraduate degree? 32.2% on the non-underrepresented side, and then let's give it up for those underrepresented, 31.6%. We're at parity. Dude, like I have to really say that dude hard. Dude, we achieve our STEM undergraduate degrees, according to this study, at the same rates within our groups. Nobody tells us this. Fam, you, you gotta tell people. You gotta just zoom in on that, say if you want it, homie, you got it. You just gotta want it. Declare it and it's yours. I think a lot of people don't get told that. At the same rates, then graduate school, womp womp, that's when things happen. Uh, and I, I sort of alluded to it, the sad picture with my PI's face cut out. Yes, grad school is different. It hits hard. But it is possible for you and possible for you to get around your obstacles. At grad school level, note that even for the non-underrepresented side, only 51.3% actually achieve that STEM graduate degree. Why? Because it is difficult. Many give up. You, get, you realize, oh, I'm past five, year five? Good Lord, when am I gonna get a job? Well, how's this working? I'm in a whole different economy now. You notice things and challenges and you slow down. It's much dip more difficult and you're actually assigned one particular educator who guides the entire process. So that is where inequity does strike. And then on the underrepresented side, only 38.1% actually achieve that STEM graduate degree. There are very different um, forces that are happening, but at some level, we all have the same stress of going through these processes, and we need to fix the graduate process with the graduate um, program process for STEM. It is failing our students, not as miserably as the, um, the grade school level, but it definitely is creating a pressure that is not allowing us to thrive, no matter how we identify. We should have much higher rates of attainment of these degrees. And then, by the time students get these degrees, what happens when you look at the academic level for who's in faculty, who's in industry, and so forth, 90% are gonna be non-underrepresented and only 10% underrepresented. The damage is done in grad school. So I want you to prepare mentally and emotionally for how you're going to set yourself up to get the mentorship, to get the sponsorship, to get the help and the support structure to make sure you thrive in graduate school. Because it doesn't matter if you're underrepresented or not, you will feel some pressure that is different and unique to your whole life experience. And it's, it's life changing. Within medical physics, please note we've had some success, luckily, for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Nominally, 40% and growing of our um, students who are within our graduate pro programs happen to identify as women or female. That is amazing in science, because you know, in physics, it's only 20%. So there's something weird going on in medical physics, and I like it. We've had five former APM presidents who happen to be women. And I want you to understand, please get ready, because I smell some more coming along the way. I can't wait to vote for them. So we've had a lot. OK, you can clap for the women. Woo! Yes. And so as I get to the tail ends of this, I want you to understand, in my leadership roles within AAPM and a number of other organizations, including your own AIP for LCRM, I have created some final recommendations, at least on the AAPM side, that are helping to make sure that those barriers that you're facing and some of the educational programs, at least on the medical physics side, we are trying to create structure and bridges so that you don't have the same issues that people in my cohort had to go through. I want you to understand, I am dedicated to making sure that we are creating inroads 
roads and mentorship networks to connect you to the type of mentors you need to succeed and to never feel like you don't belong or are excluded. And so the biggest part of my um, story is the fact that since 2014, I've been able to mentor students and help them move on to get their PhDs. My first trainee happens to be right under the 2014, and she's in Canada right now, um, and just finished, I believe she just graduated. I want you guys to understand your ability to give back. Once that full circle starts happening and your faculty creating faculty, oh, that is some of the best feeling. It's actually better than defending your defense successfully. Creating you guys as faculty members so that you can help the next generation, that makes my teeth wider. I want you to understand that. And then beyond that, by being able to offer cancer care here in America, I also do global outreach work where I get to work on global projects to help people in limited and low and to mid income countries and all kinds of settings. I got to go to Marrakesh and Harvard and so forth and meet with world leaders to help to identify what can we do for the limited and availability of radiation oncology around the world. Work that um, Dr. Curran, who has just popped in from our, your board of directors in AAPM, that he works on alongside as well. Also for my institution, MD Anderson Cancer Center, not as it only um, number one in cancer care, but I want you to understand, it is a huge supporter of mine for any of my outreach and diversity initiatives. They allow me to bring on an annual basis hordes of students. You can't even tell where I am, why? Because I mix in with the kids. That is the goal, to bring in a whole generation of kids that it has so much diversity within it that you can't even figure out who's faculty and who's actually just the student. I am able to do this with some of our leaders, um, shown on the lower panel just because of their support. What I want you to understand, I do love the role that I have within AIP under LCRM. I live for this role. I want you to understand, my goal is to make sure I am not the last Julie you see, that somewhere, someone is about to take this mic from me. That is my goal. I want one of you just eager, just like tackle me and like, hey, I'm ready. I, I, I really want to go ahead and help lead the next generation. Under AAPM, I have several different committee roles, different leadership positions and so forth, but I want you to understand, since I was a little eight-year-old, I never thought this many groups would trust me. I mean, it's really an amazing feeling. You guys have no idea. You don't stop feeling like the age you feel like you are right now when you get 41. I still feel the same. You don't change from eight till later on in life. And so I always still have that point of view as being the trainee. And so I'm gonna give you some tips for marginalized trainees, students, staff members, team members, whatever. These are some things that you can do for yourself, not that your department needs to do for you. First assess that your work climate, your classroom environment is right for you. Do you feel supported or is it toxic? I want you then to practice mindfulness. Do daily checks to see are you okay and get help for emotional distress as early as you need it, just like what you do for academic distress. When you're about to get a bad grade, you know to go get tutoring. When you start to feel badly about yourself because of that bad grade, get help too. Find the emotional assistance programs at your universities. You should have that, um, their hotline, that should be in your, in your phone right now. Don't take a bad grade and then make it feel as if that's who you are. You are not your grades. You are not your report. You are not what other people tell you. You are what you believe about yourself. And I want you to always get the help you need before things get to a toxic level. I want you then to move outside of yourself and identify allies and advocates and use them liberally. That means as much as you want and even beyond that to help you. Be selfish. That should be easy. Yes. Look for people who can help you. Who has what you want and ask for it. You know, a lot of you are like, oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. I can't just ask to come to your research lab or your center because that would be rude. No, do it. There are no rules. Introduce yourself, say hi. Can I come to your lab? I, I know you work with so-and-so. Can you introduce me? And just be open about what you want. You only have one life, get it done. Grow in your skills and profession. Note, I keep saying grow. Don't think that you have it all set in, um, in, just by nurture of your birth. You have to grow in these things. I want you to help someone else on their path as, as an ally or advocate as well. Give back. And I'm telling you, you get so much more from giving back than you get from just taking from others. So use that and then repeat. Always check on yourself, figure out what you need, get the help you need, grow, help others, and repeat. And never forget, no matter what diversity initiative is going on within your program or the university that you apply for, true tokens don't exist. No one is gonna hire you simply because of how you identify. 
let's be real. You're, you're not going to let anyone become chair of a department because, well, we never had a woman. You know, let, let's see what happens, you know, and just pick someone off the street. No, you meet certain criteria for the role, and on top of that, you have to meet some other weird ethnic or whatever category they come up with. So don't believe if anyone calls you a token, a diversity hire, or anything like that, that is their problem. Outwork them, show them how wrong they are, and don't feel like you have to talk about it. Just look at them and let your work speak for itself. I want you to always understand the isms that you will face are other people's problems. And then finally also, anyone and all of us are susceptible to imposter syndrome. So just do it scared. I know this sounds bad to a lot of you because you're perfectionist. Perfection is totally evil. You are not perfect. No one is. Ignore all the social media that tells you otherwise. Everyone is suffering in some way that you don't want. You don't want their life, no matter how rich, how fabulous they look, how smart. They, everybody feels less than in some situation. You have to just be uncomfortable. Grab that mic, lead that team, do that project, grow. That is the other side that you must get to in order to be um, the type of physicist or researcher you want. And then for those people who identify as minoritized or any other other than, I want you to realize this wonderful little proverb that I'm not quite sure if it really comes from Mexican roots or not, but I'm going to give it to the people. They tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. I want you to think about that. So they can pile it on, but if you have that growth mindset, you're going to blossom like a rose in concrete. You need to think like that. And that came from Tupac. So I want you guys to think about what it is that you are about to come against, because that's just going to be fertilizer to you if you catch the pun. I can, if you want to reach out to me, yeah. See I, see, I kept it clean, Brad. Don't worry. And so I want you to know how to reach me. You can reach me on Twitter. I'll admit I'm not as active as I used to be, but I'm going to change that. And also, you can email me at jampollard at mdanderson.org. And now I'm open to the Q&A that you guys may have. Thank you for your time. Let's give some of that energy back. Let's really hear it. Come on. Uh, yes, cell phone. And just do that. Can you stay standing? She wanted a photo with y'all. Yes. Is that cool? Can I get a photo with y'all? A thumbs up for science. Is that cool? How should I turn? All right, thanks. That'd be great, okay? One. Everyone smile. Thank okay, you. Great. Sweet. That was awesome. We excited? We pumped? Most excited I've been at 9 in the morning in a long time. OK, so we got some, who wants questions? We got questions? We got questions? So we got two people are going to help with questions. If you have a question, raise your hand high and uh, just say your name and your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can, OK? First question, Tony, you pick. Okay. Hi, my name is Kesslyn Stoneham, and my question for you was, how do you deal with sometimes being the only person that looks like you in a room? Like, what's, what's your advice for that? Oh my God, that is like the best question to ask. She's asking about feeling um, pretty much alone, and I like to use the analogy of myself being a lone chocolate chip and a huge cookie. And so, yeah, because I want to keep it tasteful, you know. And so it does happen. And what I want you to understand, the best thing that I like to do, sometimes I just have to get quiet within myself, check, make sure I'm cool and like how much I'm bothered by it. But then I look bigger. I go outside of my immediate classroom, whatever environment I happen to be within, and I find an ally at least or somebody who I connect with on some level, whether it's culturally or gender-wise or whatever, on a bigger scale. And you just keep reaching out. There are people like us available through several mentorship um, websites. You can reach out to us. But if you need it on your campus, go to the departments that are near you. Talk to the people in the math department. Talk to the people in engineering. You should find someone and some community that makes you feel like you are cared for, that you are valued, that you are seen and heard. That is the best advice that I can give to you. But don't let it make you feel less than and then retreat from everyone else. And then let's say that you happen to be in a situation where there's just nobody like you and you just can't find them, that it's just not happening. Guess what? 
own who you are. Oh, I'm gonna say it, wear your wizard hat. I want you to, like, I think a lot of people don't understand this. It is okay to be alone. Too many people are in bad, toxic relationships anyhow. Let's just be real. It is okay to be alone. We all feel lonely, even sometimes when we are in a group. You've been there where everyone's talking, you just wish they would shut up. Like, please, shut up. Like, I hate him, oh my God. It's okay to admit that, but then open yourself up and be that friend to them that you wanted them to be to you. The day in UCLA when I realized that, dog, I'm the only black person that's been in this program, this is awkward. And I realized that, I'm like, no one's saying hi to me, no one's being friendly. Guess what I did? I started saying hi to everyone. I got super annoying. I acted like the little sister that I am. I was like, hey, how are you doing? And they would look at me, because it's UCLA and they were really fly. Like, like, I don't know you, like, please don't talk to me. Who is this weird girl? I'm like, hi, I'm from biomedical physics, I'm Julie. Like, what class are you in? What program are you in? What are you studying? What are you researching? Be interested in them, bring them in, and you're gonna find an ally unexpectedly who may look so different from you, and you're going to find the people that resonate with you and support you to your success. Does that help some? Yes, very much. Cool. Hi, um, my name is Harmony. Uh, my question was, I'm sorry, I'm blanking, I'm That's nervous. Okay. Um, my question was how in such a um, progressing field that's like progressing at the speed of light, how do you deal with like the stress from keeping up and just oh. being able to juggle everything? Wow. Well, that's actually, I almost want to take a seat. Um, because my role, as um, I, I sort of alluded to, I'm a clinical physicist, which means 80% of my effort, uh, based upon my salary, is dedicated to patient care. So on top of the crazy nature of what's going on in the science realm of my field, I literally have to triage, much like nurses and doctors, which problem I'm going to work on for a patient at any time. So between um, the hours of pretty much like 7.30 a.m. till noon, I am all patient focused, completely completely, and it is overwhelming. What I have learned to do is because it is a, it's a term that we have to use, triaging, you rank it. And I just say, okay, what do I have time for right now? And what is my immediate, immediate emergency in need? And then once I get number one, I take care of that, and I go to two, three, and everything else. So literally, I'm doing that. The research stuff and everything like that, I try to put it in concrete blocks of my time, and then I look at what seems to be the hottest thing that I can actually help towards. If it's a project that I just don't have the resources for, and I don't have the aptitude or talent for, I admit it, I'm humble. And I say, hey, that's gonna be something great for my other colleague, and I send them an email and let them know about the wonderful opportunity. Hi, my name is Miles Pope and I'm a physics and math double major from Howard University. And the question that I had for you was, how do you think being in a non-black environment during grad school affected your social life during that time? Oh. Well, let's be frank. It did affect who I ended up marrying. I will admit that <laughs> It's sort of obvious, you spend the most time in graduate school, let's be real, five to seven years, it's like prison, Let, let's be real. And when you don't have people from your cultural background, your heritage, from your community, in your midst, that's an awkward time for people who are sort of at that marrying age, you know, like pretty much 21 to 30, you're sort of partnering up. And when you aren't partnering up and you're watching all of your friends partner up because they have somebody who comes from their general pool or community or whatever, you start to feel a little awkward. I will admit that. So what I did was I just went slow. I waited till I was like a completely free adult and faculty member in one of the most diverse, it is the most diverse cities in America, Houston, and I was open to anybody and everybody when I say that. I just want you to know that. And so I allowed their personality to lead the way because for most of my career, most of my training, I've been in spaces where I didn't see a face like my own, period. It's like there was just no possibility. I mean, like I was not gonna find my Denzel. Like it's like I met Denzel, oddly enough, but that's another story I'll tell you afterwards. But I did not meet my own personal Denzel. And I want you to understand, for those of you who are um, feeling sort of alone because of that, it's okay, there's better selections the older you get. I know it sounds bad. <laughs> 
But if once people work out what their angst is as a younger person, oh my gosh, you know, somebody, you know, I'm not saying twice divorced or anything. I'm just saying like somebody who knows who they are and is just as dedicated and passionate about their path, oh, that's hot. When you find somebody, my chemical engineer, don't anyone talk about him, he's amazing. I'm sorry, you know, when he starts talking about flow dynamics, ooh, I just, I want you to realize your nerd is somewhere right now giggling at some joke that no one else understands. They're waiting. And so it's okay to be in those spaces, but um, allow yourself the freedom and the willingness to go into knowing, to getting to know people from other backgrounds that you otherwise were ignoring. The, I mean, the pool, and not the talent pool, but your friendship and romantic pool is very wide. Enjoy it. Swim. Yeah, swim in that. Uh, oh, I see Hi. you. My name is Rose Alba Mustaf. My question is, could you go into more detail about your day-to-day -day work as a medical physicist? What's the balance between clinical work um, and research that you do? Do you have to stick with one or the other? Oh my gosh. Well, talking about my day, and please note, there's so many different flavors of medical physicists. I am very unique. First of all, I'm a therapy physicist, which means I treat cancer patients. I don't do imaging. There are imaging physicists, there are nuclear physicists within the field, there's all kinds of different flavors of us. So in my narrow role, I actually have an 80% clinical effort and 20% administrative effort role. So that means 80% of my time, according to my paycheck, I need to be patient facing. And I'm also a service chief, which means I'm heavily administrative as well. So 80% of my time dedicated to patients on a way that I've worked out the schedule for most of the patient care activities that I um, oversee, 7.30 a.m. till about noon on any given day, I am on my feet running through the basement of MD Anderson Cancer Center, dealing with high dose radiotherapy treatments for our patients and ensuring that quality assurance is also always taken care of and that if there is a problem, I'm literally there to help to um, troubleshoot on the fly and deal with patients and help them to understand why they have to do the breathing instructions and everything else associated with their care. From pretty much noon to about 5 or 6 p.m., that's when my administrative role kicks in real big. That's when I get to do all of my teaching for any type of coursework. I'm creating all the PowerPoints and, um, and other materials that I need for the clinical space as well as for whatever I need to lead my team and developing, um, you know, the clinical care that we offer on a daily basis. After that, I'm also um, doing all my leadership role um, work for AAPM, AIP, and any other organization that I represent in ASTRO too. So that's the way I juggle it. And my day, I would say I'm on campus 6.30 to 6, pretty much on a daily basis. But remember, I am a service chief, and then whenever the machine goes down, we have different QA that we have to do on a monthly basis and so forth. But when it goes down, it's down. And then you just hunker down and deal with it. It's um, almost like being a veterinarian or an obstetrician, too. Because all of a sudden, when, you know, when the machine goes down, that's your baby. And that's the patient care maker. You know? So you have to realize our schedules, there is some normalcy to it, but there is going to be some just um, some heterogeneity, that's a nice way to put it, when it comes to when things are down. But it is the most exciting thing, because then you feel like a firefighter slash, um, I don't know, almost like a, a dedicated cop or something, because you're helping the community so much with every little thing that you do. Hello, my name is Alex, and uh, I had a question about the flash therapy. I was wondering how the uh, effects differ between uh, the orthodox way of treating uh, cancer, like the effects between different, the patients. Oh, so compared to how we're conventionally treating them right now, it's night and day. So a typical treatment for um, a regular, let's just say like a breast patient right now, that would probably be about 30 fractions in about 15 minutes, we can give them what's called a traditional and intensity modulated radiotherapy treatment plan. Where we're gonna give them about what's called two gray a day, just the amount of dose that we offer. And it takes pretty much about all together, maybe five minutes or so of being time, and they're laying in there on the couch. Now, if we were able to do this safely and securely with flash radiotherapy, where I explained, it just changes the dose rate to ultra high speeds. We would be able to do this, sir. I want you to understand, depending on how many fields they choose to do with it with flash radiotherapy, they could do this easily under like probably two seconds or so. 
So the amount of time left on the couch, the amount of motion that you have to account for in the patient, everything is drastically different. If we are truly able to deliver flash radiotherapy safely and without unexpected late-term effects, because that's what we don't know, because it's so new, we have not seen any late-term effects with this particular um, science yet. So we need to prove its, um, its efficacy, but if it all works out, we're talking literally flash treatments. You go in, you're treated, you go on with your life. And so, and one shots or however they decide is best way to offer it. Right now, treatment is long. You go for on the quarter of what? Four to six weeks for all of your radiotherapy for regularly fractionated cases. And that wears on people, especially depending on where they're getting the radiation to. Head and neck, you can imagine, it deals, it affects their um, vocal cords, it affects their ability to swallow and everything. And they go through different types of, um, you know, um, all, all kinds of issues and side effects that you don't want to have to deal with. But flash would save and spare the normal tissues nearby. That could help us with esophagitis and all kinds of other effects that otherwise cause patients to actually lose their life more so than the tumor itself. So there's so much potential. And if this really holds true, it is a complete revolution in how we deal with our cancer patients. Because 70% of cancer patients, you may not know, use radiotherapy in some point of their um, cancer treatment. So this is essential for all of us to figure out. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, my name is Alondra. I was trying to figure out navigating undergraduate research because I have interest in different topics, specifically seismology and also plasma physics. How would one, how would I go about trying to figure out which one would be best to apply to grad schools and also looking for an internship opportunities? There are so many research experience for undergrads available across the entire country, if not also internationally allowed. Just Google literally REU, and I want you to do internships in both. Uh, you didn't mention medical physics, so I'm not gonna tell you about AAPM's <laughs> opportunity. So I, I understand we're not your jam, I get that. But the good thing is that you already have it identified just two fields. You're ahead of the game. And essentially, if you have two summers left to deal with, even if you're a senior, what I would ask you to do is literally right now, look up which professor in both um, domains is available to you for you to spend some time in each different type of lab and find out now what feels best to you, what speaks to who you are as a person. Identify that way before you go into that graduate program. You don't wanna be sitting in a five to seven year program where you're just like, you know what? I really don't like it. I just like that one paper, this bites, I want out. Don't do that, don't waste your time. Go in early, do an internship, get paid to figure out if you like it, and then once before the 10 weeks is up, you'll know. You will know in 10 weeks, like, you know what? Let's cut ties, this was not what I wanted to do with my life. Find out now, talk to those professors directly, you don't have to wait for an internship if you don't care about being um, paid or having funding. If they're really close by, it's worth it just to even do, um, if possible, um, a remote type of experience with them too. Get to see how they interact with you and get to see how the teams work together and what those dynamics are like. But definitely, work the system for you. If you don't have a summer to use, reach out to the faculty directly. Everybody is searchable on the internet. You can find anyone through any um, uh, university's email directory system. So simple. Hi, I'm Talar. Um, you had mentioned that helping others um, feel included as part of your tips for marginalized staff. And I was wondering if you could talk about a recent time in which you've helped someone in your field or career to feel included. Oh my goodness, there are so many instances. Thank you for that question. When it comes to helping others, I'm gonna leave it not patient focused, right? Because you're not talking about me helping patients. I get that. Okay, so when it comes to helping people within um, just medical physics, one of the things that I um, am doing now is I run the, um, we have an affinity group for black and African American physicists within um, AAPM.org. And so one of the things that I'm doing is reaching out to those physicists who are coming from low to mid income countries who are actually trying to get into our field. And I'm 
I'm reading their CVs and connecting them to mentors and people who can offer them the types of jobs they want just to get their feet in the door. So being available, saying, hey, I'm in and I'm gonna help make sure that you come in behind me too. Creating the bridges. Believe it or not, you don't have to have any paycheck from an organization to do this. Just simply say on your social media, I am here for you. I know how to do this, I'm employed doing this. If you have questions, hit me up. It is as simple as that. And helping to make sure that families across the world are now, even this guy in Scotland now is getting help from me to make sure that he and his family move to the right location for their center of their choice. This is incredible and I, I, don't, realize, I don't think enough of us realize how much help we can provide and how useful each of us is just in who we are right this very moment. It doesn't take money, it just takes willingness in our heart. Hi, my name's Amara. Um, so my big question is, how did you find your passion within medical physics? Man, the funny thing is that medical physics as a whole grabbed me before I found my niche in medical physics. Because my leading story is that my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer when I was at a research experience for undergrads, when I was doing my summer research program in 2000. And when I went with her for her first radiation therapy treatment, I accidentally met the medical physicist who was part of her care. And so once I realized that physics can be used to help people live, I was sold. That was it. I didn't care if I was diagnostic, I didn't care if I was nuclear, I didn't care if I was therapy, I wanted to help patients. Then I realized that I just had the gift of gab, that I like people, I like interacting, I like, I like this, I like mics, and I like everybody. I wanted to be more patient focused. And then I realized therapy allows for that. I get to deal with high dose radiotherapy treatments that allow for me to explain to patients why they have to do certain things for our treatments. Diagnostic, you're doing a lot of stuff in the background at night and early in the morning and stuff, and you're away from people. That's not my kind of deal. So once I realized that, I found the center that specializes in doing the most number of different treatments and then I found my group and I realized that there is a number of different um, you know services that we offer but for lung it does have a very bad prognosis and so forth and I have to admit at first I thought I was just gonna gun for breast cancer um, you know treatments and things but it opened up that lung turned out to be open to me and that's how I found myself in the way that I am but I will tell you every single day I have a passion for every single type of radiotherapy treatment that we offer I think right now um, even pediatrics I have a heart every time I get to assist with one of those cases it just pulls at you differently. Either you can handle looking at a pediatric cancer patient or you can't. And you need to know that, it's okay. Once you know that, but for me, seeing that little smile when they, they realize that you weren't lying to them, that everything is okay and you can offer them a mask and it's all painted and everything, depending on the type of treatment that they have, your heart, like I feel like the Grinch when his heart grew three times. Uh, how many guys read the Grinch? Wow, I'm alone. Oh my God, that hurt. Thank you, Brad, that's why I like you. Okay, so the Grinch's heart grew three times the size of what it was from the beginning of the book to the end. That's what I feel like every day. And when I get to meet you guys on a scale like this, when I used to be one of you, I want you to understand, I still see myself as a little 20-year-old undergrad. I can't believe it. It makes you feel so full. So the fact that I found myself in therapy medical physics, it just put the cream cheese on my bagel. It's everything. Hi, my name is Scott Colton, and I was wondering if we saw a difference between the effectiveness of flash radiation against cancers that are normally resistant to other forms of radiation. Oh. We haven't gotten into those types of studies yet. So right now, we're literally just trying to understand flash versus normal tissue. As far as the different types of cancer types that are more radio resistant, they haven't shown. Like for colon cancer cells versus breast cancer cells and so forth, I haven't seen that study, but please believe that is coming. And I hope that it shows to hold to be just as effective as what we would expect. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Baxter. I am a freshman at SAC right now in Texas. I have a, my goal degree is a bio, biology and a physics degree. And it's gonna be a long journey obviously, but it's gonna cost a lot of money. And I'm really looking to see how I can find or write something towards to get a sponsor or a mentor for my education. Hmm. What kind of paths do you do for those kind of people do you think would be best? Baxter, what type of biology? Are you talking about molecular biology or just regular? Biomedical 
biology in the research of gravity and how it affects the human body? The good thing is that you're in Texas, so there's a whole bunch of professors that's looking at um, such questions, especially like in biophysics. Find our biophysicists like in the UT system, hit them up directly, and find out which projects sort of align with that bio side of the degree that you're asking for. That is a way to find some funding for that particular portion. And in physics, dude, you're already in the right place. You're going to be fine for that. What I would hope is that you, you couldn't just find the biophysics department that allows for you to enjoy both parts of it. That, and that way you can only you can finish it much sooner and just four years as opposed to separate categories. Uh, you think you can do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Money, money, you know, money. I do want yeah. to work for, I do want to work for like NASA or SpaceX because of the research that we found of how it affects us when we do go into space. Like hmm. It's not exactly the healthiest I hope we do have some financial advisors in the house who are going to be much more able to assist on the direct portion of what you said. But when you're trying to go to these Ivy League schools that are charging Ivy League costs, I'll admit, I stayed away from that myself just even as a, you know, little undergrad. I couldn't handle that. I didn't want, and think about the cost versus benefit ratio too. It almost sometimes works better just to get, try to get that job at NASA and have them pay for your degree. You know, sort of think backwards, and especially since you're already, um, you know, 30 and everything, you have a clearer mindset of how you want to end up, make that boss and employer understand what your potential role can be for them if they would sign on board for, and look for their benefits they offer their employees for educational achievement. But I hope we do have a financial advisor who could assist you, because I, I do think you have options, but n I don't know about for Ivy League options. I'm not going to lie. I don't know that at all. Let's see. No problems. And good luck. Time for one or two more? One? Okay. Go ahead. My name is uh, David Kong. Um, my question is particularly about more social, I guess. Um, with words like high energy and radiation, I'm sure you get a lot of like mis miscommunication. How do you combat misinformation in your field and in science in general? Oh, misinformation? The funny thing is that when, by the time the patient gets to the clinic, um, we don't really hear too much misinformation. Um, the biggest stuff that we've heard, of course, is just due to you know, the pandemic and things like that. But what I will say is that when I'm um, just talking more to just the public at large, that's when you're more likely to see it, when I'm not dealing with in my hospital setting. And what you try to do is just remind to them the utility of the high energy physics that you're utilizing in order to save lives. That normal helps most people get around their fears, the negativity, but definitely when I, I see misinformation, I don't engage it. And I think most of you should do that too. You don't have to put on a cape and explain to everyone how dumb they are. They'll figure it out sometime. It's not your job. You're not paid for it. Let it go. Even if you are an educator, even if you're a professor, when you see silliness, like, um, was it, I'm trying to remember um, <laughs> the famous quote, you know, don't ever argue with an idiot because somebody walking by won't be able to tell the difference between the two. I think that was Mark Twain. So remember that. If they're screaming and you're screaming, everybody's red in the face, I mean, who's, who's the idiot? Both, really. So let it go. I, I, yeah, I've brushed my shoulders off and continue. All right. And I guess, is it last one? Yeah, last quick one. Hi, I'm Gabby I'm from Northern Virginia Community College, and I was wondering how you get started with research, like narrowing down a question that you're happy to pursue and see it, that it'll go somewhere and not just cop doing what someone finding out like, oh, somebody did this already. Beautiful question, and I think that's essential for all of you guys as you get ready for your labs. You go into the lab and you figure out what has not been done yet. Literally go through their history, go through their lab, their log books and everything, see what's already been and done well, find out what presentations they delivered, what is your professor most excited about, and why did they not do X, Y, and Z. Find out what is feasible, and feasible within five years. Don't go for something that no one's done before because it's literally like it's going to take Indiana Jones to find it to the very end. Like, no. Find something that is feasible within your time frame, five years. You don't have to get a Nobel Prize by the time you get your PhD. Just figure out a problem that you can systematically break down into nice chapter-sized chunks. 
Yes, think about it. Each chapter should be your paper. Make it easier for yourself. And think of a problem that you want to be thinking about when you wake up and you're brushing your teeth. They're like, you know what? This is why those molecules are arranged that way. Oh yeah, that seems, oh, you know what? It's the energy, oh, you know what? That's the kind of problem you wanna work on. Something that speaks to you, not just your professor. So first and foremost, find the lab that likes you. I'm gonna tell you, that's more essential than actually knowing, is it seismology, is it morphology? It doesn't matter, do they like you? Are they gonna have those deep conversations with you so you can figure out what the real problem is? So equity. Having that psychological safety is what's going to allow you to nurture, grow, and be the best scientist the world has ever seen. So I hope that helps, and it was a pleasure getting to meet all of you. Okay, we're going to thank you. Just stay right here. Oh, okay. Hey, you look that was awesome. Thank you all for some awesome questions. Phenomenal. Some of you may want to talk with Julie later on today. I'm sure lots of you are going to want to. They're going to be located at the AAPM booth right afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go, you got to go to the expo room. Yeah. But before we do that, I'd like to welcome Syl back up on the stage. And there's something to say. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, on behalf of SPS and Sigma Phi Sigma, we would like to thank you and give you a token of appreciation for sharing your expertise and mm -hmm. passions with us today and for all you do for the physics and astronomy community. Thank you guys. Oh, Phil, thank you. Oh my God, this is so cute. The cow? It's a spherical cow. I so love Oh, well, thank you all. So what we're going to do now is we're going to break and we're going to go into the expo room. Everybody know where the expo room is? It'll be like a herd effect. We'll all kind of go over. There's like a herd of spherical cows, right? Um, so if you'd like to see, if you'd like to talk to the, the plenary speaker more, they'll be over there in about five minutes, okay? So we'll meet you over there in the expo room.